begin today by wishing everyone a very happy Easter. And uh, I pray that you've been having a wonderful weekend, maybe with some family and friends. And uh, this opportunity that we have just to gather now and to worship. Today I'm going to share a message that I have preached a few times over my years here at Kingston West. And and it's such an important message, I think, for the times we're living in. And on this day, Easter Sunday, uh, this is an especially important uh, reminder for us all. I'm going to talk about discouragement. Have you felt discouraged over the past few years? You know, I expect we all have. Our discouragement can come in multiple forms. It might be because of the pandemic or uh, today it likely comes uh, in the form of the rising cost of living. Maybe it's the war in the Ukraine and all the rhetoric and the threats being tossed around there. Or how about health issues? I mean, that can get us discouraged pretty easily. And I could go on and on. But what I'd like to suggest is that one of the biggest obstacles we face in life is discouragement. And you know, once we get discouraged, it's hard to keep going. It's hard to find the will to even keep going. When Jesus was arrested and put to death, his disciples were overcome with discouragement. His most vocal follower, the Apostle Peter, denied him, deserted him, and then ran for his life. And today we're going to look at how Peter dealt with his discouragement and how he was able to overcome it. First of all, let's consider the cause of discouragement. So discouragement is caused by unmet expectations. You know, we become discouraged when we don't meet our expectations or when life doesn't meet our expectations or when others don't meet our expectations or even when God doesn't meet our expectations. We act as though, you know, we live in a cause and effect world and that things are supposed to turn out a certain way. We believe that if we continue to do A, eventually it will result in B. But life simply doesn't work that way. The world of investment and mutual funds is a good example. You know, an investor who selects companies to place in the portfolio, say, of a mutual fund says that they rarely ever see a poorly presented business plan, and yet less than 5% of the proposals that, uh, that their firm reviews have ever, are ever placed into the fund. And of those 5%, only 1 in t- 10 will meet their actual projections. Now, you know, if I was the owner of a business that didn't meet the projections, even though I worked hard, I put in extra hours and went the extra mile, I think I'd be very discouraged. Even when someone looks after all the details and and puts in all the effort, it doesn't guarantee success. What about out on the prairies, my friends in Eyebrow, on the farms? You know, you work hard, you plant your crops, and and yet the weather can destroy all of your hard work and all of your efforts so very easily. You can resign yourself, of course, to discouragement. What about parents? You know, we get discouraged also. Many mums and dads, you know, we do everything they know to do, and yet in spite of their efforts, their children just don't turn out quite the way they expected. Pastors are also vulnerable to discouragement. You know, sometimes it seems that our efforts have no impact on the life of the church. We pray, we study, we preach, we visit, we plan, but we don't see any visible results. And you know, it's hard not to resign ourselves to long-term discouragement. A young man went to see a fortune teller, and she studied his hand and told him, you will be poor and completely miserable until you're 41 years old. The man said, then what will happen? Will I become rich? No, said the fortune teller. You'll always be poor, but you'll have become so accustomed to it that it no longer makes you miserable. Peter experienced discouragement when Jesus died. He was discouraged because the death of Christ destroyed his expectations of how Jesus should establish his earthly kingdom. Peter was also discouraged because during the process, he failed to meet his own expectations Listen to what Peter said to Jesus, Matthew 26, 33, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. 
When Peter said this, Jesus said to Peter, I tell you the truth, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times, Matthew 26, 34. To which Peter said, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you, Matthew 26, 35. See, Peter put a tremendous amount of faith in himself, too much, in fact. When when he failed to meet his own expectations, he became discouraged. That's the cause of discouragement, failed expectations. However, if we examine them closely, we'll often find that our expectations are unrealistic. Peter's expectations, they were unrealistic. Jesus told Peter they were unrealistic, and yet Peter refused to listen. So secondly, let's examine the characteristics of a discouraged person. When we become discouraged, we tend to follow certain predictable behavior patterns in an attempt to overcome our discouragement. First of all, we can compromise. In the 18th chapter of John, when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, Peter drew his sword and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. And in doing this, Peter compromised the teaching of Christ. Everything that Jesus had said about nonviolence and non-resistance was disregarded. Instead, Peter took matters into his own hands. Of course, his plan didn't work. He lowered his standards, but not his expectations. When Peter attacked the high priest's servant, his expectations were still unrealistically high. But his commitment to obedience to the teachings of Christ had dropped several notches. We're the same way. When we become discouraged, we cling to unrealistic expectations and we'll do anything to make them happen, even if we have to sell our standards to do it. The other thing we can do is we quit. Discouragement leads to despair. This is what Peter experienced after he denied knowing Jesus. The Bible says, Peter went outside and wept bitterly, Luke twenty-two sixty-two. 62. You know, in the song, He's Alive, by Don Francisco, he captures the despair that Peter must have experienced that night. The line says, When at last it came to choices, I denied I knew his name. Even if he was alive, it wouldn't be the same. See, that's despair. The feeling that all hope is lost, that nothing can change things now. Peter experienced it. I've experienced it, and I'm sure you've probably felt this kind of despair as well. Thirdly, we withdraw. The disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, John 20, verse 19. You know, when a person is in the depths of despair, they stay at home, they become uninvolved, and they withdraw into a shell of self-pity. As long as the disciples were hiding behind locked doors, they were unable to finish the task that Jesus had given them. When we withdraw, we become completely unproductive, and we're not able to accomplish the task that Jesus has given us. One pastor shared about when he first entered the ministry. He said, I was working as an associate pastor, and the senior pastor and I went visiting. And one of the houses we went to was completely dark. And I made the comment that it looked like no one was home. The pastor said, there's someone here, and rang the doorbell. After several minutes, Joanne came to the door and invited us inside. We went into a cluttered room where the only light was coming through a crack in the drawn curtains. Joanne said, "Uh, sorry, it's so dark in here. I can't bring myself to turn on a light. Joanne's husband had left several weeks before, and since the day he had walked out the door, she had sat in a dark house crying. Because of disappointment, she had completely withdrawn from the world. Discouragement can cause us to withdraw from our environment and from our world. Fourthly, we escape. The 12-step term for this is medicate. We look for something to alleviate the pain of discouragement and despair. For Peter, it was fishing. He just went back to his work. But one thing is certain, he didn't stay to suffer through the death of Jesus. A successful businessman was being interviewed on Good Morning America, and he was asked, what's the secret of your success? And the man said, a bad marriage. I couldn't stand to be at home, so I stayed at the office until I stumbled onto success. 
He said it with a laugh, but he gave the impression he was only half joking. What do you do to escape the pain of discouragement? Some of us pour ourselves into our work or a hobby, or we overeat, or we watch too much TV, or we go shopping, or we try to make ourselves numb with alcohol. I mean, there are many things we can do to try to cover up the pain of discouragement. The problem is that after we return from our escape, our problems still exist. In fact, they're usually worse. None of these options, compromising, quitting, withdrawing, or escaping, solve the problem. We only end up cynical, skeptical, bitter, and like Peter, at rock bottom. What should we do when we become discouraged? Well, let's examine the cure for discouragement. It's the very reason we're gathered here today. Consider the empty tomb. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb, and he saw the strips of linen lying there, John 20, verse 6. When Peter saw the evidence that Jesus had been resurrected, he began to have a glimmer of hope. The Gospel of Luke tells us that after Peter examined the empty tomb, he went away to his home wondering about what had happened, Luke 24, 12. At this point... It may have seemed too good to be true, but there was a spark of hope. The empty tomb is our spark of hope. It tells us that God has the power to work in our lives today. Karl Barth said, The resurrection of Christ teaches us that our enemies, sin, the curse, and death are destroyed. They may still behave as though the game were not decided, but ultimately they can cause no more mischief. We still have to reckon with them, but we need fear them no longer. See, the empty tomb reminds us that no situation is hopeless. Peter began winning the battle against discouragement when he encountered the empty tomb. I don't know what the source of your discouragement is today, but whatever it is, remember the resurrection. Consider the empty tomb. It's proof that Jesus has power over sin and death, and he has power over any challenge we may face. You see, because of the empty tomb, we can expect the unexpected. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus, John 21, 4. Peter and several of the other disciples decided to go fishing together, and they spent the night on the water, but they caught nothing. And early in the morning, a man standing on shore called out to them, Do you have any fish? They answered, No. The stranger told them to throw their net on the other side of the boat, and they would find some fish. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because there were so many fish. And John told Peter, It's the Lord. That was all Peter needed to hear. He jumped out of the boat, and he swam to shore. Peter had gone to see that. Uh, that night to fish. He didn't expect to see Jesus. Peter was beginning to learn an important principle, and that is to expect the unexpected. You never know when Jesus is going to surprise you with a miracle. You may be on your way to leave flowers at a tomb. You may be out fishing. You may be in a prayer meeting. You never know when he'll surprise you with a miracle. You may be like the man who lay for 38 years beside the pool of Bethsaida, who was convinced that it was useless to hope for a miracle. You may be like the disabled man who sat in front of the temple gate day after day begging for money when what he really wanted was to be healed. You may be like Lazarus who died thinking that his closest friend wasn't there to comfort him in his hour of death. You may be like Martha who thought that God waited too long to show up, and now her brother was dead. You may be like the woman at the well whose search for love led her through a series of failed relationships. You may be like Peter who made mistake upon mistake and who, in a moment of weakness, deserted the one whom he loved more than any other. All of these individuals have one thing in common— They all had reached the point of being discouraged, and then they had an unexpected encounter with the power of God. Some of you here today may be overwhelmed by discouragement. Maybe it's your job or your family or your marriage or your financial situation. It could be anything. Maybe you're asking yourself, why should I keep on? What's the use? Why don't I just quit? 
Well, you know, I can give you a reason. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive today and he is at work in our lives. That means we can expect the unexpected. You never know when Jesus is going to surprise you with a miracle. Maybe we can't control the so-called principle of cause and effect. Maybe we can't get the results we want when we want them. But we can be faithful. We can keep on. Things won't always be the way they are today. And because the tomb is empty, we have the right to expect the unexpected. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that the tomb is empty and that he is alive today. And that through him, through your Holy Spirit, you are at work in all of our lives. And we can always expect the unexpected. So, Lord, I pray that you would, uh, just as we spend this day reflecting on the empty tomb, we invite your Holy Spirit just to come into our hearts and lives in fresh and new ways to assure us of your presence, your peace, your promises, uh, your joy, your love, and all that you have for us. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. And thank you for your promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.